Good morning, Thessaloniki. You know, I woke up this morning truly feeling like the luckiest man on earth, because just like most of you, I was once born in this incredibly beautiful country, the most beautiful country in the world. But unlike most of you, I was raised by the most beautiful society in the world. I was raised in a society that I often call the land of the misfits. And let me tell you why. I am a misfit. I might be the weirdest guy you've ever heard speak. There's a few things about me that are strange. I was born really different. I was born with different genes. I had a little bit of Asperger's in me and in my family, which made me a strange kid. It made me a very unusual kid, gifted with some special skills. But when you're a kid, you never think of your gifts as gifts. You think of yourself as being an outcast. Because of my Asperger's, I was raised with an extreme math brain. When I was four years old here in Greece, they had me on TV, because back then, at the age of four, I could tell you what day of the week it would be on the 10th of May, 2014. When I was seven years old, I was on concert stages like this, competing against 17-year-old kids on piano, just because my other gift was music. And frankly, music and numbers dominated my entire life, dominated my childhood, made me the geeky, strange kid that did not belong in school, that didn't have any friends, that wasn't a popular kid, that just felt really, really lonely and isolated. And of course, I was living in a very homogeneous society. I was living in Greece, where, frankly, everybody's Greek, everybody's Christian, everybody speaks the same way, everybody tries to think the same way. So I stood out, and I always felt like the strange kid that just did not fit in. But to make matters much worse, from a very, very young age, I knew I was gay. So imagine growing up gay in Greece in the 1970s, in a Mediterranean society, macho society, Christian society, and I was gay. And I thought, I will never belong. I thought truly my world was never going to be any brighter than it felt that day. But because of my Asperger's, I really didn't have, I didn't understand my limitations. I didn't understand when I should start and stop and when I shouldn't say things. And I still haven't learned that lesson, by the way. And so I tried to change the world. And because I was a little kid or a teenager, I didn't quite know how to change the world. At least I knew how to change my world. So I packed up my bags as a teenager, as an adolescent, and left Greece and moved to Canada. And I moved to Canada because I was looking for one place in the world where it's truly a society of misfits, where everybody is so different from each other that instead of just tolerating our differences, instead of just saying, I'll put up with you because you're a little different than me, we actually take our differences and we harness them into national assets. We make our country richer, better, smarter, cooler, because we are also different from each other. It's the one place where you can be as Greek as you want to be, as Chinese as you are born, as Christian, as gay, as autistic, as anything you want. It's the country where we take the immigrant's perspective on the world, and we actually make it an asset for our country. We make it an economic niche for our nation. A place where we take the gay kid's perspective on the world, and we actually turn it into policy, into better policy and better laws for the future. Or where we take the autistic kid's perspective on the world, and we harness it instead of marginalizing that weird brain of his. So I settled in the land of misfits. And frankly, I had a pretty good life. Met the man of my dreams, got the career of my dreams and the education of my dreams. I became the CEO one day before I was 40, which was a bit of a quirky numerical dream of mine. I wanted to become a CEO of a large firm before the age of 40. So I became the CEO of one of the largest marketing agencies, and one of the oldest marketing agencies in Canada. Everything seemed to be going great. But the autistic brain was always there, and he was always kind of doing funny things in the background. I had to be different all the time. So one day, when I didn't do a very good job of buying the company I was running, I was too fed up with having somebody else own the company. I wanted more autonomy. Tried to buy the company, did not succeed. And I was sitting in my backyard one day, and I was thinking, hmm, what next? And that day was the spring of 2007, when Al Gore's movie was out, talking about the climate crisis. And I happened to be, among other things, a climate geek. I loved weather and climate. Because of my numerical mind, because my, my brain was always looking for outlets and numbers and you know, satisfaction with numbers, I loved everything to do with weather and climate. 
I would make the most boring dinner date you could ever ask for. Because I would sit at dinner with you, and all I would do is talk to you about you know, the, we the normal weather for the middle of May for the Saloniki, or normal annual rainfall for Mongolia. And it was the most useless hobby anybody could ever have <laughs> until the May of that month, until May of 2007, when the whole world is now talking about the climate crisis. And there is one guy, one senior leader in marketing in our country who gets it. All my colleagues were thinking, how do we rush out there and paint every car and every bottle and everything we manufacture? How do we rush out there and make it green so that these people can buy it from us? And I was thinking, no, guys, this is a much, much bigger trend. This is something that's going to change our world forever. This has barely begun. In 2007, nobody was looking out the window and saying, oh, my God, the sky is falling. The symptoms hadn't even started yet. Consumers were barely even responding to it back then. But I knew it was coming because I was the climate geek, and I knew a little bit more than most of my peers. So I thought the one corner of the industry I know inside out, which is the loyalty industry, the points industry. You know where, when you go to the store and somebody gives you points for having spent some money, or when you, you, when you pay your phone bill and you get some extra points with that, or when you fly with an airline and you get a few extra miles? Well, that industry was my expertise. That's exactly what I knew well. And I thought, you know, Nobody has come up with the idea yet of creating a green points program. A points program that doesn't reward you for just shopping, but it rewards you for shopping responsibly. Nobody had thought of it. It actually scared me when I did a bit of a globe scan and realized that nobody had done that yet. It scared me because I thought, is my idea too stupid? Is it too unusual or is it too simple? And yet, with the help of an extremely, extremely creative and aggressive co-founder, we just plunged right in. We plunged right into becoming, to creating the world's first green points company that would compete against these multi-billion dollar giants that build points programs all over the world. And we were this tiny. We were that tiny little firm that decided to create this huge disruptive fight. We were truly the disruptors. We were on headlines of newspapers across the, Canada, across the country, and everybody was celebrating the fact that this little company was trying to disrupt the space. I remember a headline in one of our business newspapers in the fall of 2007, and it said, the ones to watch. And of course, in our misfit country, anything that's different is sexy. And Newspapers loved us, the media loved us, because we were different, we were tiny, and we had the guts to fight the multi-billion dollar guys. Well, three surprises after that have defined my life ever since, and I think will define the rest of my life. Surprise number one, within 18 months of that time, our tiny little business, which was not so tiny anymore, had been purchased by the largest loyalty player in North America. They swooped right in, bought us, not because they wanted to eliminate us, but because they saw this big trend. They saw the same trend I had seen 18 months earlier. And they said, you know what? Instead of us trying to create all this change inside our giant program organically, why not incorporate these green people, these crazy green people in here, and let them infect us? Let, it, let them infect the largest loyalty program that exists in North America and make it green quickly. And it was amazing. It was amazing. It felt like one of the most beautiful moments in my career, because now, as a divisional president inside this, inside this monster organization, I felt like somebody gave me this huge steering wheel that every time I turned it a couple of degrees, tens of millions of consumers would follow me. If I gave them points for ripping up their credit card bills and saying to their bank, don't ever send me paper again, switch me to electronic bills, they would do it. If I gave them points for going to the grocery store and buying better food that was more locally grown and had a lower carbon footprint, they would do it. People are so crazy about points. And by the way, <laughs> nowhere are they crazier about points than in our country. So in Canada, it was incredible. You would give them points, and they would, just a few points, and it would change the behavior of millions. So that was surprise number one. All of a sudden, I had a deal. Somebody had bought me. I had this enormous thing available to me, and I could just turn the wheel and the whole country would follow. Imagine how few times you get an opportunity like this in your career. Surprise number two that was even bigger, though. Within a year or two of that, I got a call from the government. And the phone call went kind of like this. Hold on a second. You guys have the most powerful marketing tool in the country. You can take the whole country and get it to go wherever you want it to go. And you've made it environmentally authentic. They believe that you mean business. You're not just doing it to make more money. You're also doing it to make the country a better place. 
why can't we, the government, work with you to use the power of your points to not only change the way people shop, but to change the way our citizens behave, to get them to take the bus a little more and leave their car at home, or to get them to conserve electricity, or to get them to recycle their garbage. And I have to tell you, that was probably the only moment in my career that I felt truly embarrassed, because a government, a government out-innovated me. And I thought that was strange. <laughs> but it was amazing. It was the creation of a whole new business for me. Imagine the amount of money that our governments, all of our governments, including yours, spend to change the behavior of their citizens, from encouraging us to quit smoking, from encouraging us to not litter in the streets, or respect the environment, or do whatever it is they want us to do every day, especially, especially at the time when it came to the environment. So I thought, wow, let's try this. And of course, we tried it, and the results were unbelievable. Not surprisingly, because people are crazy about their points. So now, if you give them points and you say, use less electricity, or recycle your garbage, or take the bus. You know, there's one city in Canada now, it's the only city in the world where every single time you ride the bus, you get points. <laughs> it's so simple. When you think about it, why do you get points every time you fly a plane? Why shouldn't you get them when you ride the bus? It's so cool, and it changed behavior. The results were truly, truly incredible. So finally, after that, came surprise number three. I get another call from government. This time I wasn't embarrassed. But I got another call from government, and this time it was a health ministry. And the health ministry said to me, what is wrong with you people? Why are you only focused on the environment? Don't you realize that health is even more important to us in government? Don't you realize that the most important thing we could be doing as a government agency is motivating millions, or in some cases, billions of citizens to live healthier lives so that we can actually save money at the other end when we don't have to fix them in the hospital. It's so much better to invest upfront than to actually spend the money curing them afterwards. And we thought, oh my God, this is even bigger. This is way bigger. Because there is so much you can do to take the masses of consumers out there and with tiny, tiny incentives, encourage them to live healthier lives. I'll give you one that per applies particularly here to Greece. It would be so magical if somebody tried it here, because you guys are the land of smokers. <laughs> and in Canada, we're not. In Canada, very few of us smoke. Only 17% of the population smokes, but that 17% is still a problem for the government. So the government decided not to give Canadians points for quitting smoking, because that would be too complicated and too painful, and many people wouldn't bother, but to give us points just for phoning in to a smoker's helpline just for taking that tiny, tiny first step. And of course, many people might take the step just to get the points and not really mean to quit smoking. But the beauty is, once you've made that call, once someone has connected with you, the system takes over. And the system knows how to fix the rest of the problem. So we just did our job as marketers to connect the population with a big, ugly machine that had never thought of using the word marketing before, that big, ugly machine that's called government. When you bring the two together, you have magical results. So we started with, we actually didn't even start with smoking. Smoking came later. We actually started with the world's first healthy eating incentive program. If you can believe this, we took one entire chunk of Canada and we gave all the consumers in that province points just for showing up at the grocery store and buying healthier food. Instead of buying hamburgers and sausages, if they just simply bought fresh produce, they would get lots of extra points for that. The results were astounding. The results were so unbelievable that this avalanche then began across the country and other people started calling us and saying, what about us? You know, what if we gave them points for phoning into a smoker's helpline? What if we gave them points for taking a little health quiz or for even donating to a health charity for phoning into a mental health awareness line? Anything you can imagine has since come up. I don't want to bore you with the story of my business. This was not to be about business. This was to be about how having a weird brain can sometimes make a difference. I grew up, like you are all growing up, like most of us, frankly, are built to try to fit in. And when you think about it, in our quest to fit in and try to look normal, what we end up doing often is quashing the things that could make us special. Imagine how beautiful our world would be if all of us could unleash those things that make us so weird and so different from each other, and imagine how much fun we would have with our lives. Thank you very much.